Okay, well, thank you all for being here. I know we have a little bit of a short window with you all, so I just want to make sure that we get the most out of our time together and give you all a little bit of an overview as to what we will be covering today. We're going to briefly dive into reimagining migration, a quick discussion around belonging and narratives, and then we have the ultimate pleasure of passing it over to Jessica Lander, where she will discuss historical cases and their present day legacy, which is, I know, something we're all really excited to, to hear a little bit more about. And then we will be allowed to, there you go, allow recording, and then we will discuss really why this matters and what some actionable resources look like. And I really hope that we have time for Q&A at the end. And so I really just want to start us with why reimagining migration is entering into this question and what our ethos is around the work that we do. And so we're really starting with what role do schools play in the physical, social, emotional, and academic development of young people? And if we had a little bit more time, I would love for us to go around and just sit with that question and really think, what is the role of schools? If we're if we're re really reimagining how we serve our students best, what are the roles? For the sake of time, we kind of grouped them into three categories, physical, socio-emotional, and academic. And so really when thinking about physical, we're talking basic needs, breakfast, lunch, shelter, facilities, um, you know, PE and <laughs> like physical movement, um, and also understanding of physical development education, as well as really thinking about that, like, you know, consensual contact, the high fives, the pats on the back between students, that level of just being in space with each other, and then safety. So those needs surrounding safety. Then we also thought about the role when it comes to social and emotional thinking, identity formation, socialization, community building, and self-actualization. So really that whole bucket of the social emotional that we are really starting to focus on more and more, but then also the academics, kind of the traditional things that we think about when we think about the role of schools in terms of foundational knowledge, critical reasoning, logical analysis, that creative expression and evaluation. And so really thinking about these as the buckets of the roles that schools play, we then also wanna ask, what about immigrant origin students specifically? And so the thing that we're really circulating around is belonging. So what does it mean to show up as your most authentic self and not just be accepted, but also really be celebrated? So our conversation or question is how can we make belonging part of our education and centering around the role of schools when thinking specifically about our immigrant origin students? And the way we kind of get at that is through the base question of how are we preparing our young people for a world on the move? And through collaboration with Project Zero, we really got down to these dispositions or habits of mind. Now, we talk a, a lot about this and it's definitely really in depth to go over in a short webinar, especially knowing the amount of space and time that we want to do to the histories. But at a really high level and thinking about dispositions and habits of mind, it's what is the way in which we want our school communities to function? How are we wanting our students to behave in relation to one another? Again, keeping our immigrant origin students in mind and thinking about the role of schools in serving students, breaking it down to kind of one being understanding one's perspective and others empathically inquiring about human migration with care and nuance, right? How are we building communication across differences? And really thinking, what are the indicators of some of these things? How do we know when our students are communicating with care across differences? What, what would that really look like? And what is the role of schools in facilitating that? How are we able to have conversations that recognize power and inequity? And again, what does that look like in practice? And how does that kind of culminate in our students being able to take action to cultivate inclusive societies. And so when we're really thinking about these dispositions or habits of mind, or how are we getting these to be just second nature for our students, especially when thinking, okay, what is the role for schools and the support of academic communities to facilitate the building of these skill sets and having these be second nature in our students' minds. And so I know that's kind of a high level of a lot of really intense work, but, what that really brings us to is the role of schools and the language with which we talk about them. And so one way we want to think about that is the language that we use and the goals that are then associated when we think about newcomer education. And so 
starting off, right, we have the assimilationist mindset of what happens when minority groups are encouraged to adopt the majority group's values, systems, and are encouraged to hide aspects of their own and really wanting to think, when is assimilation kind of a go-to or something that we're not even thinking about its role in the way we, we shape our education system? Because then we also have integration. So what does it mean when we have, you know, cohesive and complementary whole students able to engage? And when they're able to retain their qualities and identity, and then if we pair that with that aspect of inclusion of the belief that all children are different and will learn differently, how can we actually have scaffolds and supports that are representative and celebrate the differences within our students in a way that also allows them to be integrated, right? So really thinking about that maintaining of self while also celebrating the individuality and the complementary. And so this is really leaning into that asset mindset of what is what is being brought to the table that's so beautiful and so powerful and how can we preserve that while also, again, providing the scaffolding and the resources and celebration. And the reason we really want to take a moment and think about the language here is I want this to be something that we think about as Jessica goes over the cases. What was the conversation at the time? Was it leaning assimilationist? Was it leaning towards integration? Thinking about just like what were some of the preconceived notions that were potentially happening in the ed education community and conversations? And the that language, right, it, it comes back and it's really important. I want to say I'm based in New York, so that's why we have just the conversation that's happening within New York City schools is because we're hearing it in the radio, on the train, and our students are hearing it as well. And we really want to pay attention to the language that's used when it says like an influx or schools are bracing to prepare or thousands, right? There's a lot of this hyper fear that's being, you know, spurred, but that's not the case in the, you know, the schools having a, like very individual responses and you're having schools saying that they're ready and they're prepared or that what's happening in this conversation is just calling for more services, more outreach, things that our schools needed, right? Conversations that are really bringing up to the front how we can better serve our students in our schools. And we have to think about these headlines and the language that's used and the way that translates into the classroom and what students are hearing and how you know their peers are hearing it and around themselves. And so we really wanna think about not only the fact that it's sensationalist and sometimes missing the hope that's really there and the powerful educators, some of who are in this webinar with us, who are doing the work to really, really, you know, shape education around belonging and inclusion and making sure all students thrive. And this has been done before, right? So in 1900 to 1914, New York City schools saw a 60% increase in registration. And what did the city do? You know, we can say at a base level, they invested in education and parks and playgrounds. So you had this rise and you had a response. And not saying that this was the solve all, because if we look back, a lot of it was assimilationist curriculum. But this is just a reminder that we are in a history of movement and that we can respond to change if we put at the center of the goal, <laughs> raising the environment for all students, supporting all educators and schools in doing so, and that that should be the conversation that we're able to engage in. And as we think about the history and understanding how we arrived here, I'm so excited to pass it off to Jessica Lander to kind of trace us through some of the laws and the legacies that we are currently navigating. Well, thank you so much um, for having me. I I just want to give a shout out to Reimagining Migration and um, just the extraordinary work that they do um, and how much I have learned from the organization and all the folks involved in this work um, for so many years. Um, and then just shout out because I know Adam's on the call as well, um, that Adam has been a mentor to me for years in helping me support the work that I do both in the classroom and then um, this work of storytelling that we're going to dive into. And um, so just really honored and excited to be here with the Reimagining team today. Um, I am excited to be with all of you um, on this supposedly snowy, not snowy day here in Boston. Um, and uh, I want to tell you a little bit about my classroom, but mostly about some stories of the past that have been really exciting me over the last three years. Um, so First and foremost, I'm a teacher. Um, I have the honor and joy of teaching recent immigrant and refugee students from about 30 different countries up in Lowell, Massachusetts. 
Um, I teach students from Colombia to the Democratic Republic of the Congo to Cambodia. And um, it is the work we do in our classroom and the work we do in our community that ultimately inspired me to go out of the classroom, to step outside, and then go sit in the classrooms of others to learn about ways in which we could reimagine immigrant education, which is why particularly the work that Reimagining Migration does is um, so, so deeply important to what I am doing as well. Um, and so I wanted to start by showing you some uh, pictures of my classroom because this is the why for me. Um, it is the work I do with my young people, um, the ways in which they're collaborating and supporting each other's learning every single day, bringing all their strengths to the classroom, and then taking those strengths and those skills and bringing them out into the community. And so um, I, I'm watching them each day, supporting each other, but then going to be teachers and leaders in our community, bringing that learning out and advocating both for themselves and for each other. And it was through watching them over so many years, seeing the strengths that they bring, but also realizing that in many ways, our schools don't recognize, value, or invest in those strengths. Um, and recognizing too, that I could be a better teacher for my students, that I decided to set out from the classroom and um, to learn in the classrooms of others and to try to understand how we could reimagine immigrant education to think about how we could really invest in and value our students for all they bring and set them up for success as they're building new homes and new lives here. And so I, I set out across the country back in 2019 now and realized pretty quickly that I, I needed to understand three sets of stories. First, stories of the past. There are extraordinary stories of historic laws, cases, and movements over the last 150 years that have transformed our schools, transformed how we think about immigrant education. But many of these stories are, are not known. And I'm going to share just two of these stories today. Um, but these are remarkable stories, and they need to be known, and they need to be taught. And they impact what schools look like, how we teach today. And they're essential for us to be, to understand um, and for us to be drawing lessons from. In addition to those stories of the past, I think it's important that we learn from stories of the present. Remarkable schools and creative experiments and really innovative educators across the country working in classrooms from North Dakota down to North Carolina. And they're doing just really exciting things, exciting experiments and creative um, approaches to supporting immigrant origin students in a whole range of different capacities. And I'm also struck by how often the work they're doing is not known outside their community. I'll give you the example, um, and I won't talk about this particular school today, but there is a, a really fascinating school right here in Massachusetts called Enlace, and it is 15 minutes away from where I teach in Lowell. And yet I didn't know about it until I set out to write this book and to do this research. And that's a problem. Um, we need to be able to learn from each other. We need to be able to uh, identify folks doing really innovative work so that we can go sit in on their classes. I, I wish as an uh, earlier and younger teacher, I could have gone over 15 minute drive to Lawrence and sit in, in those classes and how much I could have brought back to my classroom so early on. And so there's so many experiments and um, creative approaches and ideas out there that are not known, um, but need to be known. And then finally, in addition to these stories of the past and these stories of the present, for me, this is the heart of the work, is those stories of the personal. And uh, I know this is something that is central to the work that Reimagining does as well, Reimagining Migration, is the, the importance of young people's voices. Um, that if we're serious about reimagining immigrant education for uh, young newcomers, we have to be learning and listening to them. Um, and so when I was setting out to learn these stories, diving into the past, uh, flying across the country to learn from folks in the present, I was also sitting down with some of my former young people and learning from them about their experiences of growing up in other countries, their experiences of migration, and their experiences of creating new homes and new lives here and learning in our schools. And I, I think it's through these three sets of stories, stories of the past, stories of the present, and stories of the personal, that we're gonna be best set up to imagine what's possible in immigrant education. And as I was learning all of these stories, and we'll get into just a few of them in a few moments, but as I was learning these stories, 
Uh, it, it comes back to one thing, and that was already highlighted. And another reason why um, I, I so love reimagining migration's work is um, the importance of belonging. And that at the end, fundamentally, this is about nurturing a sense of belonging and that belonging is fundamental for all young people and particularly for newcomers who are creating new homes and new lives here. And so then it's a question of how do schools better nurture that sense of belonging? Um, what can we do in our practices, our programs, and our policies in the communities we create um, that help ensure that young people believe that they belong here, feel that sense of belonging, so that they're the best set up to invest their talents, their energies, their creativity, their heart, their passions into this community, enriching their new homes, and they're best set up for success for, for themselves and for their families. And belonging is something that we're talking more and more about in education, which is really exciting and wonderful. Um, and so I wanted to present to you what I have learned from all these folks that I had the opportunity to talk to, what I'm calling the eight pillars of belonging, because belonging can be somewhat nebulous. And like, what do we mean? How do we actually put that into practice? Um, and so from all these folks that I talked to, I extracted these eight pillars, and I hope they resonate with you. Um, but that to, to nurture that sense of belonging, particularly for immigrant origin students, it's important for us to, for them to have opportunities for new beginnings and supportive communities, to have assurances of security um, and chances to dream, committed advocates and recognition of students' strengths and assets, and acceptance for who students are and where they come from and all their many beautiful identities. And finally, opportunities for students to be developing their voices, for us to be valuing those voices and listening to those voices. And so what I wanted to do today in our, our brief time together is to, to explore two of these pillars through the lens of the past and the present. We won't get to the personal today, um, but please feel free to, to get in touch with me and I'm happy to share more. And there's of course more in my book and my work. Um, but I wanted to tell you a few stories and full disclosure as a history teacher, I nerd out about the history. So I'm going to try to rein it in uh, because I, I do think these historical stories are just really, really remarkable and really important. But I wanted us to sort of trace some, some connections between the past and the present um, and dive into some of this history and look at some of these present day creative, innovative approaches. So the, the, two sort of sets of stories I wanted to look at. The first is bringing us to this idea of security. And security for um, for me and for the, the educators I talk to across the country really comes down to sort of two elements. One is a lot of our newcomer students, our immigrant origin students, um, might have experienced different forms of trauma, um, either in home country, in their migrations here, or in their, their present living in the US? And how are schools set up to best support immigrant origin students in feeling safe and secure and um, social emotionally healthy in schools? That second part of security is um, too many of our immigrant origin students experience hostility and xenophobia, either in schools or in communities. And what can schools and educators be doing to address that? And so I'm thinking when I'm thinking about security of these sort of these two elements, these two aspects of it. But the first story I want to tell you brings us back um, about 100 years, a little bit more, to Nebraska, rural Nebraska. Um, and uh, this is actually a story that uh, Adam first introduced me to many years ago. It was not a story I knew. And indeed, many of the historical stories were, again, not ones I was ever taught, but need to be taught. So this story takes place in rural Nebraska on a May afternoon in 1920. And this parochial teacher in a one-room schoolhouse, Robert Meyer, is teaching his students the Bible in German during recess. And for doing this, he is arrested. Because of course, at the time in Nebraska, it was illegal to teach languages other than English. Indeed, in about half the states in the country, it was illegal to teach languages other than English. And in some places, it was illegal to speak languages other than English in public spaces, including on the telephone and, uh, and trains. But Robert Meyer doesn't back down. And as is true for him and is true for so many of these historical stories, at the heart of these cases, these laws, these movements, 
are courageous individuals who are steadfast in advocating for uh, immigrant origin students. And so Robert Meyer doesn't back down. He gets arrested and then he brings his case all the way up through the courts. And his case goes up to the Supreme Court and in 1923 comes back uh, in favor of Robert Meyer, enshrining for the first time the right for students to learn and teachers to teach languages other than English. And this is happening on the backdrop of a rise in anti-German rhetoric and sentiments um, and attacks um, following World War I. Um, and yet here we're seeing this teacher advocating for his students, advocating for his community, and enshrining these rights for students to be uh, seeing the strengths that their families bring um, as real strengths that are valued in the community. But I also wanted to just highlight, and again, this is me being history teacher and finding just all these different elements fascinating. This is also happening on the backdrop of what would become the 1924 Immigration Act that sets up the quota system um, that is a highly discriminatory immigration law that uh, has dramatic impacts on who is let into the country for many, many decades to come. Um, and it also, this, this rhetoric, these laws, um, this xenophobia has a huge impact personally. And as part of the book and part of the work that I was doing, I had the opportunity to speak to a lot of the folks who they or the families were at the heart of these stories and helped transform history. And I got to speak to the daughter of the little boy who was reading German on that May afternoon when his teacher was arrested. The little boy at the time was 11 years old. His name was Raymond Parpart. And I got to speak to his daughter. His daughter is now in her 80s. And her daughter told me the story of how when she was about 10, 11 years old, the same age that her father was when Robert Meyer was arrested, that Robert Meyer actually came out of retirement and lived on their farm and taught at the school that he was once arrested at and taught her. But what was just devastating to hear is that during that whole year that she was taught by him and growing up with her father, she, she never learned German. And so despite this huge win and this advocacy, the, the impact that xenophobic policy has on families in a, a, for generations um, and the ways in which it impacts families to, to lose or to hide parts of themselves, parts of their identities. It reminds me of my own family's story. Um, my great-grandfather Daniel arrived as a seven-year-old in 1906 as a refugee from what is now Ukraine. And when he arrived, his language, his history, his culture, his religion were not wanted or welcome in U.S. schools. And the impact that had on what he brought forward into teaching his kids and teaching his grandkids and what was lost um, for our family because of the, the impact of what schools said was valued or the rhetoric or the policies in the community around them. Now, we have this historical story of the past and I want to tie it to stories of the present. And so I wanted to share a story that takes us a little farther north to um, North Dakota and the classroom of Leah Jolke, who is a fantastic award-winning teacher who teaches all recent immigrant and refugee students at a big public high school. And in addition to teaching classes that are fully filled with newcomers, she also created a class that was, um, its aim was to build bridges because she saw that there were many different divides in her school. I see the same in many schools um, where immigrant origin students um, don't feel necessarily connected to the school. And there's a lot of othering of our students. And so one way Leah has worked to, to address this is to create a class of essentially, let's call them old Dakotans and new Dakotans. And in this class, students who are new to the country and students whose families have been in the state or the country for many generations come together and learn together. And they share stories. They share stories of their growing up and then they step into each other's shoes and speak from the I voice as if they are each other, um, sort of embodying each other's stories. They share lessons from their history, from their cultures, from their communities, and then co-create and co-teach lessons out into the community in 
uh, elementary schools and middle schools, sharing their histories, sharing their traditions together. Um, and they also write books and share those out into the community. And um, finally, too, just thinking about that, that those policies and the xenophobic policies, when in North Dakota, a, a, a policy was suggested that would have allowed school, have allowed cities to ban refugee resettlement. Leah's students went and testified at the state house, um, advocating against these xenophobic policies. And ultimately, those xenophobic policies did not pass. But the ways in which her students are leading both in the classroom, in the community, and then at the state level, advocating for um, more understanding, more connections, more empathy between uh, students who come from very different backgrounds. So that's my first story of the present and my first story of the past. I wanted to give you one more and we do wanna have time for some, some resources and collaborations and conversations. So come find me if you wanna learn more of these stories. But the second story of history that I wanted to tell you uh, talks about that pillar of acceptance. And this story brings us to Texas. In the late 1970s in Texas, um, the Tyler School Board, the Tyler School District, changes their policy and decides to charge $1,000 tuition for every student who cannot prove legal residence in the U.S. And that's roughly one-fourth of most undocumented Texans' annual income at the time. And four families, again, this is about the courageous, uh, stories of courageous individuals, four undocumented Texans' families um, decide to sue their school. And that's a perilous choice they make. I talked to um, Alfredo Lopez, one of the four family, the children of the four families. And he told me the story of how his parents the night before packed their car to the brim, filling it with um, clothes and possessions and even their family TV. And the next morning they woke their kids before sunrise and drove the two blocks two blocks um, to the federal district courthouse in Tyler, Texas. And they part, they packed their car that evening and drove it to the courthouse that morning because they knew that by walking into that courthouse and suing the school district, they were uh, risking immediate arrest and deportation. But it was a risk they took to fight for their children's access to education. Now, that fight and their courage um, leads to what becomes, of course, Plyler v. Doe in 1982, which comes down from the Supreme Court and enshrines the right for all students access to the public K-12 system, no matter their documentation status. And it leads to a, a generation of young people who um, grow up believing they belong in schools until, of course, they turn 18. And this then leads to um, the Dreamer movement and calls for the DREAM Act first in Texas and then at the national level. And then after the DREAM Act fails, President Barack Obama announces DACA on the 30th anniversary of Plyler v. Doe. And the connections and the, 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 the connections we can see between the past and the present and the ways in which this the courage of these families impact um, the, the students we have today and the access they have to schools, um, I think is really powerful and really important for us. Now, I wanted to share one final story um, of thinking about another group of students who are often denied access to education in the US. And um, this brings us finally to Georgia and to a present day story. Um, if So in Georgia is the Global Village Project. And the Global Village Project is the only school in the United States dedicated to refugee girls who spent a long time out of school. If you are a 16-year-old young woman and um, you have perhaps never had a chance at academic formal schooling, you show up in the United States, you are likely going to be put in 10th or 11th grade. Good luck. And indeed, in some cases, you're going to be told um, you cannot go to school at all. Um, now, the Global Village Project recognizes that this is not a winning strategy, um, particularly for kids who are absolutely denied an education, but even for young women who have never had a chance at academic formal schooling and being put in 10th or 11th grade, um, that's not going to work. And a, a young person might need to start at a kindergarten level of education, but also 
they are a young woman who likely has shouldered the responsibilities of a mature adult for years, and you can't treat them like a kindergartner. And you have to honor both of those identities. And so what the Global Village Project has done is has created a very personalized, individualized curriculum that is meeting each student where they are and helping them recapture all those years of lost learning. And they're doing that with the support of about 100 local mentors who have committed to coming in every single week to work one-on-one -on -one with students, helping create uh, lots and lots of opportunities to practice um, language, English language with a native speaker, um, because these folks are possibly the age of their grandparents, lowering that barrier for embarrassment. Um, so it allows students to feel like it's okay to make mistakes. Um, I know from my own personal experience of learning, um, you, you don't want to make mistakes in front of your peers. And so how do we make it possible to do that in a, a safe and welcoming and warm environment? And then this also, this um, approach creates mentorship programs and mentorship connections that help families and students navigate um, both the community as they're building connections and then also navigate high school after they graduate from Global Village Project and college and beyond. And so thinking about the ways in which this school is really trying to support on a one-to-one -one basis these young women today who are often being excluded or told by schools that they do not belong. Um, and I just find the work that they're doing really, really powerful um, and a lot that we can draw on. Now, I want to create some space for questions and collaborations and conversations. And so I'm going to pause there, um, recognizing that I could go on because there's just like so much powerful history. But um, I, I want to thank you all for coming here and just um, to reiterate that importance of belonging, of thinking about how our, our policies, our practices, and our programs in our classrooms, in our schools, in our communities have such a profound impact on um, how our immigrant origin students feel either that sense of belonging or um, feel that maybe not all of their identities are celebrated and valued. And um, the important um, role that we can play in changing that and making sure students feel welcome, feel invested in, feel valued in our community. Well, thank you so much. That was such rich knowledge. And in kind of bringing that forward with those connections, I think really fits along the arc of action. And so kind of we're with in collaboration with Project Zero, part of our ethos comes from this learning arc. And what our fantastic Jessica Lander just did for us is really kind of both go through that entire story, all of it touches on the life before the journey, but really what we're seeing there is kind of that last step of adjustment of what does it look like? You're here, you're in schools, what are the rules that kind of garter what you can do with your bodies, who can enroll, what can you speak? Like all of those things are part of that adjustment piece, which kind of brings us towards the end, which is that turning to action. And so what actions can we take to build more inclusive and sustainable societies? How can we build off that history and those stories of the present and bring them into action? And in kind of combining our learning arc and that turning to action with Ms. Lander's fantastic kind of conversation around the personal past, present, and possible, we want to think of, okay, for the personal. Now, again, we would love to just sit down and have this conversation with all of you. We do want to make sure we have time to get to the Q&A, but these are some of the questions. So. And thinking about the personal, why did what we go over today, right? Why does this matter to you? Why does this matter to your students? And then why does this matter to your community? So what is your personal connection with some of the information that we've discussed today? What about the past? How do you see the impact of this history in your classroom? Why do we need to know these laws and their legacy? The present how can you draw on these stories from the present to adapt or build off of? How can we bring those present moments where we're hearing stories of community elders leading in the school and students being able to be met at wherever they're at and whatever their needs are? How can we use those to build off of and adapt what we're currently experiencing? Which is really exciting because it brings us to what is possible, right? That last, that last tier. And how can we really imagine a new future? And so some very tangible possibilities is curriculum. So how can we teach these stories alongside the laws that govern your students 
And how can we discuss frameworks for change, right? We we have resources on that. that. And that is kind of part of the possible is the possible is exceptionally possible when done in community and in done in collaboration with fantastic individuals such as yourself. And so we have resources that we will send after this, after each of these, I'm going to say we have resources, but we do. Um, next is with your colleagues. How can we highlight these stories in PD? How can we encourage deeper exploration into the communities and the histories of immigrant education and student rights? How can how can we be briefed in all of the different laws and policies that have led up to today and those that are on the docket, right? How can we really immerse ourselves in colleagues and conversations, which once again, we do have resources um, and we also facilitate PD. So not just resources, but we also do go into classrooms and help facilitate these conversations with colleagues. And last but not least, really thinking about community. So how can we invest in whole community discussions? How can we bring, as was just named, these elders and non-traditional history leaders into, into our schools? We're thinking really of students as also forms of history, their families, libraries, local museums and site, and just really thinking about how we can make education immersive into all parts of society. And again, I'll say it one last time, but we have resources on a lot of these things. Um, and again, I really wanted to make sure that I could preserve some end time for Q&A. And so if you have questions about any of the content that we've covered, give you some, some time to think about that. And then if you have any questions about those resources, we will follow up via email, but I'm also going to drop my email in the chat right now um, for any resource-based questions. Would you like us just to uh, shout out or raise our hand or um, what? What you can shout out. Why don't you? If you'd like to shout out, go ahead. And then if you, if anyone else has questions they want to follow up, you can put your sure. name in the chat. Um, my name is Ron Verdicchio. I'm a, a professor at uh, William Patterson University in New Jersey. We're about twenty miles from New York City, two and a half miles from Patterson, uh, New Jersey. And uh, so with that backdrop, uh, I, I want just to throw an idea out um, to teachers who teach in suburban school districts that that demographic is changing uh, quickly. And in some cases, uh, teachers who have uh, never had to deal with a, a changing school population find themselves in the last five years having to deal with a very different student population. And I'm thinking in terms of uh, 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 migrants, people who have found their way into suburban uh, areas. My question to you is, what advice can you give us with regard to uh, PD? What is it, uh, how, how, do we, how do we help teachers create that welcoming, environment when in fact they're really struggling uh, with the everyday. We can all dive in. We're all like really excited to dive into that. Honestly, I know you know Adam. I don't know, Adam, if you want to share on that really quickly and then either Jess or I can support. I mean, I, I, I would just say that I, I think that Ron's observation just to start with is exactly right. I mean, you know, the the demographics are shifting, and so I I would I would suggest that we need to spend some time thinking a little bit uh, about what are we prioritizing when we're when we're leading thinking about what professional development our teachers need for the year. You know, unfortunately, you know, when when PD money is allocated around migration issues, it's I mean, it's wonderful that there's concern around language development, but so much of it is focused on language development instead of kind of these larger questions of belonging. So I, I would actually argue that the language pieces are a subset of belonging instead of belonging being a, a, a subset of language. Uh, and so I, I, I would suggest some sort of shift there. I and and I don't and I don't want to be um, you know, I don't want to tutor on horn but we'd love to work with districts that are working 
working on these issues. You know, we we don't do a tremendous amount of uh, a work with individual districts during the year, but there are, you know, communities working on the shift we'd love to be part of. And then we're also, we will, and I'm sorry, I'm talking too long. We're also working on our own online professional development modules to make sure that people can get access regardless of where they are. But but Jess is doing some of this work too. Um, yeah, I just want to echo Adam, and I was putting in the chat that reimagining migrations um, PD is fantastic, and so definitely you should check it out. So I can toot their horn. Um, there, it's great. Um, I also do lead professional development, um, but I just really wanted to also echo what Adam said. I think the um, the importance of thinking about immigrant origin students and their their whole humanity, and not just thinking about English language acquisition. And while that's a really important a uh, component of making sure our students can be able to navigate all the spaces in the U.S. Um, I, I think sometimes we can sort of focus too much on that and think about and, and forget to think about all of the other aspects of what it means to create a home here um, in a place where you feel that sense of belonging. And so when thinking about how your your training teachers or working with schools around policy um, thinking outside of just how we support students in ac ac accessing English language acquisition is really important. So just echoing what Adam said there um, and agreeing to um, Ron with what you said about that more and more communities across the country are welcoming in newcomer students. And this is um, a, a much more present discussion for communities that maybe haven't had to have uh, that discussion before. Um, and so the need for supports. Um, and then there's also lots of great folks doing work in communities, again, sort of to the point of there's a lot going on that we don't know about. Um, and so how do we identify what's going on in communities or in neighboring communities that we can lift up and that we can learn from? Absolutely. I think, again, both of what they've shared is so important. And I think a really beautiful part of the PD that we do is creating action projects where individuals are kind of able to share across and with each other what they're seeing, what they're witnessing with their students. You know, I think it's the little things of, OK, I have a few new students who seem to feel uncomfortable in the cafeteria. And then a few other people think, oh, I'm noticing that as well. And really just crowdsourcing what it's people are witnessing. And then also, again, as both Jess and Adam said, really scaling the responses. If if you know of a teacher who's doing it in this classroom and they've seen an improvement by having lunchroom buddies or guys, just the little things to really be able to center the students' experiences in a full way of, you know, what's on a fourth grader's mind when they walk through the doors um, and really just being able to share that in PD with, with other teachers. We do have two other questions that I really hope to answer. I'm going to read them just so they don't get lost. Um, do you feel like resentment towards EL students at schools comes from traumatic experiences that families of school staff experienced when they first immigrated? So that was one of the questions that we have in the chat. That's an interesting one. I mean, I'd love to hear both of your thoughts on this. Well, I think it, it could certainly be in some cases. Um, I, I think there's also just a it's interesting when I, I talk with, so I, I teach mostly recent newcomers and then I teach one class that is a, a combination of newcomers and students whose families have been in the country for generations. And for many of those uh, latter students, they have very little knowledge about where they came from, which of course could be because that is a sort of a, that has not been um, sort of carried forward in their family traditions. Um, because of how their grandparents or their great-grandparents experienced um, either feeling welcomed or unwelcomed in spaces. But I, I think, too, it just speaks to a, a lack of connection to those stories of migration. And so one of the things I really value, um, one of the resources that uh, Reimagining Migration has is conversations um, that center stories of migration as something that is shared amongst all of us, um, whether those are migrations from one side of a city to another or one state to another or one country to another. But these stories of movement and migration are ways to connect us where I think right now in schools, for the most part, they're often um, places of division. And so how do we center those stories, those histories of migration in all aspects of our curriculum? They're there, we're just not highlighting them. Um, and I think that could also be part of why there is often that othering of uh, newcomer students. There, of course, 
a whole number of reasons why too, based on uh, not teaching the the histories of um, many countries or a whole bunch of stereotypes that are perpetuated in schools about certain of our students. But I think that's one too, is we're not centering those stories of migration. Um, and that allows for that othering to take place, even if we're not doing it intentionally. Yeah. Misha, just if it's if it's worth it, just adding just a, a a slight bit onto what Jess said, and I, I think there's so there's so much there. But one thing I would say is that I think that we we've sort of normalized the idea that immigrants are going to lose their identities somehow. That sort of become normal, and so I would argue that that's one layer of desensitization. But the second I would say is that there's actually some very interesting sociological research on demographic change that that in some ways relates to older work on school integration from the 1950s, which is that when people come and have parallel experiences but don't get to know each other, that leads to increased discomfort and, and increased anxiety. I would argue that that's too many people's social experience with newcomers, social experiences with people who are different than them. And one way we need to think about schools is the way that Gordon Alport did in the 1950s, which is as vehicles for integration. When are we creating the opportunities for kids to, as Jess shared earlier, to, to work and, and uh, get to know each other, right? Give folks a common project. It's amazing how quickly they will start to build relationships. Absolutely. I think that that all really circled back to kind of our earlier conversation around language. And again, thinking of that integration as the key piece and, and thinking about the way we speak about newcomers and maybe an increased number in your school or an increase in your classroom. And I think, you know, when it's framed as like resource allocation, it can start to stir those tensions instead of having the language be about the opportunity and the call for, you know, abundance of care. And so really just thinking about the way that we frame these conversations. Thank you so much for spending this afternoon with us in what on the East Coast was supposed to be a snow day. Thank you for coming to school um, and learning alongside each other. We will send out um, a follow-up evaluation and a follow-up spread of resources that we have. Please don't hesitate to reach out. If you're looking for more, if you have questions, we are really here to be in partnership with you all. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. you. Share the recording. We will send out the recording. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you.